Good evening, everyone. I think we'll get started. My name is Sheila Brown, and I'm the Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, SACEPA, which I think, as many of you know, is a joint initiative of St. Mary's University and the Atlantic School of Theology. Our mission at SACEPA, which is based here in Halifax, is to provide an arena for critical thinking, discussion and research into current challenges in our society, all looked at through an ethical lens. We do, while we're based here, we do offer programs all across the country so that the C in SACEPA does, uh, does mean something. And in fact, we have uh, 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 over 25 people already online watching this in a live stream option. So um, with our live stream options, we can reach right across the country and in fact internationally. I'd like to thank you all for coming out in person for the second presentation in our series on the elements of food, water and oil. We started in January with food and tonight we turn our attention to water and specifically the, the oceans. I'd like to just give you a preview of coming attractions. The third presentation in this series on oil will take place on May the 16th, same time, same place, when the speaker will be Andrew Nikiforuk. We also have uh, another upcoming event on May the 22nd in the same venue at the same time when Dr. David Dean from the Atlantic School of Theology will, will speak on, and I'll, I'll just read the title so that I, I capture the exact uh, focus of his presentation, Touching the Wounds, a Theological Reflection on Remorse, Reconciliation and the Catholic Church in the Pedophilia Crisis. And there are flyers on the desks which I invite you to, to take. Tonight's presentation is co-sponsored by a number of organizations and I would like to, to recognize them. The Department of Geography at St. Mary's University, the Department of Philosophy at St. Mary's University, the Port of Halifax, and the Canadian Business Ethics Research Network which is a national uh, network funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, which aims to promote knowledge sharing and partnerships within the whole field of business ethics across private, governmental, NGO, voluntary and academic sectors. And SACEPA is proud to be the Atlantic hub for the Canadian Business Ethics Research Network. So we want to acknowledge with appreciation our sponsors for tonight's presentation on water, um, specifically carbon and the oceans when oil and water mix. Uh, as I mentioned, we do have a number of uh, individuals who've joined us by live stream and I'd like to welcome them as well as welcome those of you in the room and remind everyone that the presentation is being recorded. We archive all our presentations. So when we open the floor to questions, we ask you to go to the microphone in the, the center aisle. I know it's a bit annoying when you're at the corner of the room, but it's also annoying when you're listening to the, the archived presentation and you hear the answer, but you don't have a clue what the question was. So we'll, we'll ask you to, to do that for the benefit of a good recording. I'll also ask those of you who are in the room to be so kind as to fill out the evaluation forms that are distributed around. Your feedback is very useful to us in, in forming future programs for the separate events. And if you are joining us via the live stream option, uh, you can send in your evaluation by just following the feedback loop, that you'll, the link that you'll see on, on your screen. Um, we did plan a, a small reception afterwards, but the, um, the food seems to have arrived already. So some of you I know are enjoying it now, and that, that's fine. Um, but if you eat it all now, there won't be more later. So uh, I, I'll leave it to you when, when you'd like to, to nibble. 
But one thing I'm sure you will want to do afterwards is Alana's book is for sale. Uh, it's a great bargain, $20 all in, hard copy, and Alana has been kind enough to say that she'd be pleased to sign copies of the book for anyone who, who purchases it. So please stick around afterwards. So the, the plan for the evening is that uh, after Alana has spoken, we will have a question and answer period, which I will, will moderate. And I'd now like to hand things over to Dr. Robert McCalla, the chair of the Department of Geography at St. Mary's University, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Sheila. And may I extend my welcome to you all. It's a lovely facility we're here, and uh, we have a, a reasonably sized audience. That uh, is for the people on, on stream who can't see us, but it's a, it's a nice audience. It's my um, distinct pleasure and honor to introduce Alana Mitchell to you. Alana is an acclaimed journalist, Canadian journalist, who writes about science and social trends. It's not fiction, though, that she writes about. Um, this is real stuff, uh, and it's well-documented synthesis of of concepts and facts written such that I won't say the layman, but at least the public can understand the intricacies of, well, uh, the concerns. And of course, the concern tonight that we will hear about, of course, is the oceans. Uh, she focuses on investigating changes to life support systems. And uh, the ocean, of course, is a primary life support system of this planet. Uh, her book, which uh, you already uh, had reference to, Seasick, was published in 2008-2009. It, in fact, has been used this term in a geography course uh, taught by one of my colleagues, Dr. Kathy Conrad. And this afternoon, Alana visited the class, and um, that text was her book. And uh, the students, I guess, had read it. Is that the case? Anyways, they asked all sorts of questions about it. And uh, you talk about uh, book signing, I guess there was a lineup afterwards to, to, to have it signed. So there you've got a, an audience there that, that you addressed this afternoon. And I think you valued that experience, and I know the, the class did too. Uh, from 1987 to 2004, Alana, well, was a working journalist uh, in the first instance with the National Post and then moved on to the uh, Globe and Mail. But since 2004, she's been an independent researcher and author and discussant, quite frankly. I mean, not only does she write, but she talks, and we're going to hear that tonight, thankfully. Uh, she has three academic degrees. It's always nice to acknowledge academic degrees in an academic institution. So um, her BA is from uh, uh, the Trinity College University of Toronto in Latin Literature and English Literature. Now, I find that fascinating, of course. This is all very good uh, subject matter or, or substance for all you arts students out there who don't know what you're going to do with your degree. Well, she didn't know what she was going to do either. But so he here we have it, a Latin scholar who ends up being a journalist. Uh, um, she went on to do a Bachelor of Applied Arts in Journalism from Ryerson University. And just to give you an indication of the respect uh, that she has garnered through her work, she was awarded an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from the University of Regina just recently. Uh, congratulations. Um, before Alana begins her talk tonight, I wanted to read a short passage from Seasick to you. It, it's almost the last pages, well it is in the last pages, and I think this encapsulates uh, well her message. Quote, ocean change is extremely serious, and we have some power to halt or reverse it if we alter our actions rapidly, profoundly, and en masse. This is a call for wisdom, not for logic, for hope rather than despair. So, with that thought, Atlanta Mitchell. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's a real honor to be here in, in Halifax. I love Halifax. Every time I come here, I decide absolutely I'm going to move here and live here for the rest of my life. So <laughs> it's uh, be, beware, I could be here more often. Um, 
and, and it's a particular honor to talk about the ethics of these issues because I'm a journalist and so, you know, of course we never talk about ethics, obviously, and <laughs> never deal with them really. Um, that's a joke. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrific um, opportunity for me to think about some of the implications of the work I've been doing and frame it in an ethical, uh, in an ethical uh, framework because this is not, um, this is not something I, I often do in public. I do it privately and not, not in public. So. Because I'm a journalist, I'm going to not, I'm not using PowerPoint. I was telling um, uh, the, some of the people here at the, at the center that I have divorced PowerPoint for good or for, uh, for ill, and uh, I just decide that I will tell stories. And so I'm just going to tell you some stories tonight with, I hope, some, um, some facts woven in that will, will be helpful to you. And I'm going to try to link at the end to some of the ethics. And I hope that what I'll do is end on a note of hope. And if I um, somehow forget to do that, then ask me, because <laughs> I think that we could talk about hope here. Um, and, and the thing is that I, you know, I'm, I'm the daughter of a biologist. My dad uh, was a biology professor um, until the mid-1990s. Mid and, uh, and I think I grew up with this. It, it was sort of what we had at our dinner table, you know, thinking about how systems work and how creatures work within systems. And I think that is what led me to, you know, make the leap from Latin literature to, to, uh, to journalism about biology, because uh, it, just, it just fascinates me to understand how these systems are put together. And for the first big chunk of the time that I wrote about science, which was mainly for the Globe and Mail, I never thought about the ocean at all. In fact, I never gave it a moment's thought. I lived on the prairies, grew up on the prairies, and, and I didn't think about the ocean, except I think that I thought of it as a transportation area. I thought of it as the thing that held in the beaches. And I thought of it as where, you know, where we got fish. My dad used to fish in the summers and we used to get salmon from time to time when there still were some big ones um, a long time ago <laughs> when I was a kid. And, and so I don't think I ever thought about it as it's, I didn't think about the biological power of the ocean. Um, until quite recently. In fact, I was right at the end of writing my first book, which was all about ecosystems and, uh, you know, which was about which was about things that were happening on land and in the air. And I was right at the very end of that research when I ran into a very famous marine biologist named Sylvia Earle. Uh, does anybody here know Sylvia Earle's work? You know, she's the great, she's the great diver. She's the National Geographic explorer who figured out, one of the very first marine biologists to figure out that what she really needed to do was to look at creatures where they lived instead of taking them out from the ocean and flopping them on a, on a, you know, a dissection tray somewhere and looking at them after they had died. So she figured out how to make um, instruments that would take her deep into the ocean and she actually has spent so much time in the ocean that she's known in academic circles and affectionately by her students as her deepness which always fascinated me. So I was on a cruise with her. Do you need to, is something wrong with the sound here? No, we're good with the sound? Okay. So I was on a cruise with her and I was doing the, the, the research for the, my last book, my, the first book I wrote, and it was all about the land and the atmosphere and climate change and deforestation and all that kind of stuff. And she was, uh, she was my bunkmate on this cruise. And I was really frustrated because all I wanted to do was be on these, these volcanic islands in the Galapagos where Darwin had had his laboratory. And I was quite frustrated at being in the ocean. And she loved the ocean. I mean, she used to look out for the horizon, you know, every day she used to sort of feed off it. You could see her drawing energy from the ocean. And she never wanted to go into the land, really. And one day I got really frustrated and I said to her, but you're a biologist. Why are you so interested in the ocean? And she said, well, my dear, the ocean is where the life is. And my whole universe shifted on its axis. And I thought to myself, well, if that's where the life is, and if I'm supposed to be writing about the science of life, then I have to understand the ocean. And it launched me on this huge um, journey that led to the book, book Seasick and to a whole bunch of research since then. And what I learned, you know, what I learned shocked me and fascinated me because I learned that it's really in the ocean that, that, the, that, that the switch of life resides. So the building blocks of life are really contained within the ocean. And that includes much of the carbon cycle, much of the oxygen cycle, much of the nitrogen cycle. These are the building blocks of life that are controlled, at least to a large degree, by, by, the, by the ocean. Every second breath of oxygen you breathe is produced by plankton in the ocean. It's an amazing thought. 99% of the living space on the planet 
is in the ocean. So when you're flying, you know, at 36,000 feet, you don't see life all around you. But when James Cameron went down to the 36,000 feet down to the Marianas Trench, was it last week? You know, there was life almost all around him. That, that whole huge, big volume of water is, is filled with life in the ocean. So. What that meant for me, because I'm a journalist, is that I had to see it for myself. I'm just one of those people who has to bear witness to what, I, to what I'm, I'm, I'm learning about. And so the very first journey I took was to see a coral spawning. Has anybody in this room seen a coral spawning, just by chance? just to see. It's one of the great wonders of the world. And it was only in the, in the 1980s that scientists figured out how corals actually reproduce. It was one of the great mysteries. How do they do it? They're these little, you know, little tiny creatures with not even a brain. They just have a single orifice and they, you know, they build these massive structures of calcium carbonate that are the nurseries of life in the ocean. And how do they know when to spawn? Because they can't, you know, just sort of go and tap somebody on the shoulder, you know, when the time comes. They just all have to spawn at the exact same moment. So I ran into a, th this wonderful marine uh, biologist named Nancy Knowlton, um, who's now at, at, uh, in, at, in Washington, D.C. She's the Sant Professor of Marine Biology at the Smithsonian Institution. And I, I had read a whole bunch of her papers because I'm an obsessive reader of academic papers on this stuff. And I, I was prepping for this. So I, I read a whole bunch of her papers and I sent her an email out of the blue and said, where are you going in the next six months? Can I tag along with you? Because that's my technique, right? I tag along with scientists and they explain stuff to me. It's a great gig. And um, so she said, well, you know, here's one of the things I'm doing is I'm going on a coral spawning to Panama. And I said, basically, what's a coral spawning? You know, it was that, it was, I was that ignorant about it. But she said, she was incredibly gracious. She said, come down and I'll show you. So I went down to Panama and it was, it was in September and I, and, and we were prepping and she said, I hope they spawn. I hope they spawn. I hope they spawn. And I said, what's to hope? What's, you know, what's, what are the parameters here? And she said, well, this particular type of coral that we're going to look at, is, is, it's a type of Montastrea coral, and those are the big reef builders in the, in the Caribbean. And she said, it should spawn, these guys should spawn between five and seven days after the last full moon of summer, a hundred minutes after sunset. And I said, how do they know? And she said, we haven't got a clue. Somet somehow corals are able to sense the lining up of the earth the sun and the moon, and they're able to figure out that that's the best time for them to spawn, and they all do it in this mass sort of orgy in the ocean. And so it's, an, it's the most astonishing thing. So she had assembled this huge team, like there were about 25 PhDs. I'm thinking this is some brain power, right, to watch these little orifices you know, get some spawn going here. And, and for night after night after night, there in the Caribbean, we were, we were waiting for these, these things to spawn. And in the water that year, was 2005, was incredibly warm. It was one of the real El Nino years when there was a tremendous amount of warmth in the ocean. And we got in, it was just like bath water. And night after night after night, you could see these, a lot of the corals had, had bleached, so they were, they were starving and, the, and their, their, their flesh was shredding off the coral reefs they had built. And we weren't sure that our Montestrella would do it. And so night after night, we would go and night after night there was nothing. Finally, day six, after the last full moon of summer, we get in the water, all this huge crew of us, and the water is electric, literally electric with the energy of these corals that are just about to spawn. And they've got these little bundles that are, you know, rising to the surface of these little single orifices in their bodies. And these, these bundles are filled with both sperm and eggs because these guys are hermaphrodites. And they're just getting ready to spit them out. And everybody gets incredibly excited, humans among all the other creatures. And all the creatures on the reef are just enthralled with this. You can see that the ones that are not spawning that night are getting ready to eat the spawn and the other ones are just getting ready to eat the spawn that are eating the spawn and it's just it's the most extraordinary dance of life that I've ever ever experienced and the and and you, you could feel it course through the entire reef and at 100 minutes after sunset the spawn started these little pink bundles started being released from these single orifices and they and they rose up to the surface of the of the Caribbean Sea and 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 went on to mix with other genetic material from other Montestrella that were also spawning that same night somehow this mass reproductive right just happened and we knew that corals had been on the planet for something like 450 million years and had probably been doing something like this for that whole span of time and we were just we were astonished astonished by the power of this and we caught some of these little spawn and and the smell of this was very 
punky let me say, it took weeks to wash off the smell of the coral spawn. And we caught some of these little creatures in plankton nets and took them back to the labs. And we were really proud of ourselves, really pumped. We said, oh, we're team spawn, you know, we got all these little creatures. We witnessed one of these great, you know, one of these great natural rituals that happens in the wild. And we got them back to the, back to the lab and we put them under the, the microscope to watch to see how many would reach the 16 cell stage, which would be viable conceptually in the wild. And by about four in the morning, as we were counting these things, getting more and more bleary-eyed, we realized that only about half of the corals, the Montestrea, that ought to have spawned actually did that night. And only about half of the corals, coral embryos that we, that we captured and then examined under the microscope got to the 16 cell stage. So it's possible that given the you know, the stress they were under by the heat, given the immense warmth in the ocean. Maybe this was an absolutely fantastic spawn. But to us, they're, you know, poised to witness this great ritual of birth. It felt like death. And when you patch that against the fact that 80% of the corals in the Caribbean have died over the last 30 years, and that 20% of the corals in the rest of the global ocean are, are, are in danger, and 50% are, are all, you know, like right on the edge of being endangered, it, it, it feels like, it felt like there was something critically, critically wrong with the state of the ocean. And that was my first journey of the 13 I made for seasick. And so I decided that I simply had to keep going. I had to go deeper and deeper, both you know, in, into the research and eventually into the very depths of the sea. Um, um, so I, uh, you know, what's happening essentially in the Caribbean is that the carbon load that we've put into the atmosphere is affecting that medium of life that we know of as the global ocean. I, I thought I'd stop and give you a little bit of a carbon primer here. I'm sure you all know this, but I just thought I would you know, d d d give this a little bit. What we're doing today when we're putting carbon into the atmosphere is we're burning fossil fuels. And fossil fuels are just fossils. They're plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. And the carbon that was in their bodies, that's stored in their bodies, was the carbon from another era. So when we dig them up and burn them and put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, we're putting ancient carbon into today's budget. So just conceptually, if you, if you burn a tree, that's today's carbon. And if you burn a lump of coal or burn oil in your car, that's yesterday's carbon going up into today's atmosphere. And the thing is that we've, we've burned so much of that ancient carbon and put so much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that we've increased the load of carbon in today's atmosphere. That's why scientists call it the, you know, the, the overloaded carbon atmosphere. And we, we know that that changes climate and, and that's having huge effects in some parts of the world. And some parts of the world, they say that the seasons have become forgetful. And, and farmers don't know when to plant. Rains don't come when they're expected. Um, all around the world, glaciers and ice are melting because of that extra carbon in the atmosphere. Um, and, and People say that worldwide drought is just around the corner. Some people call it global warming, and they try to they try to say it isn't happening. And I think it may be more accurate to call it planetary destabilization. So about 30% of that extra carbon, the ancient carbon that is in the atmosphere today, has been that has been put into the atmosphere over the time that we've been burning fossil fuels has been absorbed into the ocean right across the surface of that huge huge 71% of the of the of the planet's surface that is ocean there's been this exchange of molecules so carbon dioxide has gone into the into the ocean in the atmosphere carbon dioxide is inert its job is just to hold heat against the body of the planet in the ocean um, carbon dioxide is chemically reactive with water, so it creates carb carbonic acid. And we put so much extra ancient carbon into the atmosphere, and so much has been absorbed into the ocean that has actually caused the ocean to become more acidic, which is something I'm sure most of you, all of you probably have heard about. Um, and for a long time, scientists used to say, isn't that fantastic? There's the ocean absorbing some of that extra carbon from the atmosphere, absorbing some of that extra heat from the atmosphere that is held there by the extra carbon in the atmosphere. And they used to say, great, there's the ocean, it's our buffer. Except that now they know that that's not really the case. It, in, in fact, there are huge effects of all of that carbon load on the global ocean. And I'm going to be talking about three things that are happening. One is the ocean acidification that, that I just talked about. The second is the increase in temperature of the water. And the third is, this, is the creation of dead zones in many of the coastal areas or in some of the coastal areas around the water. And together these things, um, if, you're, you know, if you're one of, the, one of the scientists I've talked to around the world, they, they call these the evil troika 
of ocean change, ocean chemical change, each one caused or linked to, to the use of, of uh, carbon and to carbon loads in the atmosphere. And the reason they call them the evil troika is that individually each one is terrible, but you mix them all together and it's, it's what, they, what, what scientists say is that, the, that it really is, uh, it's a catastrophic situation in the making and that's why they get so excited about it. The one that they're worried about the most is this ocean acidification and that's the carbonic acid that is going into the ocean. Before we started burning, Carbon, uh, before we started burning carbon-based um, fuels, so fossils, um, the pH of the global ocean was 8.2. Today it's about 8.05, which doesn't sound that bad, except that it's a, you know, that's a pH is measured on an exponential scale, and that difference actually means it makes, it means that the ocean is 30% more acidic today than it was before we started burning fossil fuels, so call it 250 million years ago. We know that the ocean hasn't been this acidic in about 55 million years. It's really quite serious. One of the first scientists to, f to identify and write about this phenomenon phen phenomenon is, is Joni Kleipas, who's one of the great scientists of the, uh, in, in America on this, on this issue. And she was the, one of the co-authors on the very first paper on this, which was in 1999 in science. And she told me that when she and a bunch of other biologists, you know, wrote down calculations on the back of an envelope and figured this out for the first time, figured out how much carbon was in the atmosphere, how much was in the ocean, what was happening to the acidity of the ocean, she said she literally ran from the room and threw up because the implications of this are so enormous. And I said to her, well, what, what does it matter? What does it really matter that the ocean is becoming more acidic? And she said, calcifiers. And I said, I don't get it. And she said, as the ocean becomes more acidic, the calcium that is in the ocean is less available for creatures to use to make their shells, to make their, you know, their, their reefs, to make their bones and their teeth. So if you're a plankton that has a calcium carbonate shell, that's a problem. If you're a, a, a coral trying to build a reef, that's an issue. If you're, if you're a, a mollusk of any sort, which are dominant in today's ocean, that's, that's a big problem. And, and so we already can see in some parts of the ocean that creatures that have calcium carbonate shells are becoming pitted and thinner, that the shells are becoming pitted and thinner in some parts of the ocean where there's already a, a larger load of carbonic acid in the ocean, and those would be the cold parts of the ocean. So it's, it's incredibly serious, and that was only the, the sort of, the, that was back in, in about uh, 2006, 2007. In the years since, scientists have done a huge amount more research on what the effects of, an, of a more acidic ocean are. And they've discovered that one of the issues is that creatures can't maintain their own internal chemistry. So their, their, their digestive systems can break down. They're, they're just, they just use up a lot more energy trying to maintain homeostasis. That's one of the big phenomena, and it doesn't even necessarily have to, have to do with whether they have calcium carbonate shells. This is the seems to be common across creatures, some creatures in the ocean. Some creatures are going to do fine, they think, but some creatures are really not, not doing well at all. One of the, um, you know, one of the, one of the things they've discovered, for example, is that some fish in the acidity uh, in the ocean that is as, as acidic as it is today, instead of learning that they have to swim away from their predators, they somehow, something gets, there's an interference with their sense of smell and sight, and they swim toward their predators not ultimately the great survival strategy, actually. Um, but, that, but that kind of phenomenon is going right through the, 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 um, the marine system. And um, of course, as we put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the ocean will become increasingly acidic. By the middle of this century, if nothing changes, if we just keep on the course we're doing, we're on now to put, as, as we burn fossil fuels, if we just keep on, the ocean will be 150% more acidic than it is than it was before we started. So it'll be at about 7.8 on the pH scale, which is a, an increase in acidity of 150%, which is astonishing. So that's the first one. The second one is, is, is this lack of oxygen in some of the coastal zones of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the ocean. I'm sure some of you have heard about these dead zones that are created. And the phenomenon there is, is pretty basic. You know, the, the one I went to see is in the Gulf of Mexico. And the year I went to see it, it was almost 20,000 square kilometers in area. And that doesn't count its volume. So I was there in, in the Gulf of Mexico with a team of researchers who were looking at, you know, we were examining this thing quite minutely, both, you know, to see what, what big creatures were in it and even what the microbial structure was. It's one of the first studies to look at the, you know, the disruption of the entire chain of life within this dead zone. And it was astonishing to see nothing come up from nets. You know, we were, we were trying to fish, we were trying to get samples of fish to test their, their tissues and things like that. And so we would trawl at regular intervals throughout this water column. And we would trawl 
and trawl and trawl and nothing came up. Like we had nothing in the nets. It was absolutely spooky the way that there was just so little in these nets. And then we would, we would actually, we questioned whether we had a problem with the, the, you know, the mechanics, whether there were holes in the nets that the fish were getting out of. And, we, and so we would use the, measure, the, the measurements of the, of the water and we would go in, out of the dead zone into a zone where there was actually still oxygen dissolved in the water. And there were the fish and we caught them. And it was almost, when we actually got fish in the net, it felt primal somehow, as if some, somehow something had gone back to rights again. And then we went back into the dead zone and again there was nothing, 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 nothing. And the phenomenon there, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, the phenomenon there is that right up and down the Mississippi River, farmers are using are using nitrogen and phosphorus to help grow their crops. They're putting on chemical fertilizers, synthetic chemical fertilizers, and these and these chemicals are flowing down the Mississippi and going off like a like a faucet into the Gulf of Mexico, right at the delta there. But these these chemicals are still food for plants, and so they. They create algal blooms. Alg algae love these things, these little plankton. They go crazy with all the food. There's not nearly enough you know, other creatures to eat them. So they, they, uh, they, get, they make these huge blooms. They die. They fall to the bottom of the water column. And then the second part of the process takes over, which is the bacteria begin to decompose all of these little phytoplankton that are there on the bottom of the ocean. And as they decompose them, they use up the oxygen. So from this one little spot, on the, on the bottom of the, fl of the ocean floor, at the mouth of the Mississippi River, this huge dead zone spreads to 20,000 square kilometers. And the year I was there, um, um, it was it, in many parts, it went right from the bottom of the ocean right up to the top, throughout this whole water column. It was an absolutely immense, immense thing. Of course, it comes every spring as farmers begin to put fertilizers on their crops, and it disappears every, every winter when they stop putting, putting the, um, putting the, um, the, the, the chemicals on the crops. And it's not clear, however, that life comes back in the same assemblage in, in the interim periods, in some, of the, in some of the other dead zones that have been looked at ac across the world as the chemicals have stopped being put in, that life doesn't come back in the same way to those, to those different parts of the coastal zone. When I started researching this book, the official number of dead zones around the world was 150, and that was really, people were really upset about the fact that there were 150. Um, as I was doing the proofreading and final research for the book, which would have been in about 2008, the number uh, rose again to 407. <coughs> and that number's on the rise. The latest figures I saw on this were that, that it's 534, and another 200 or so are imminent. So this is, you know, it's pushing towards 775. And the thing that makes it so scary is that three of those that, that have been identified are caused not by direct chemical input, like nitrogen or phosphorus, into the water column. So in other words, they're not easy to, you know, it's not just that you stop putting the chemicals and the thing goes away. Three of them are caused by climate change. So changes to the current structure and the temperature of the water in three major current structures around the world. One of the biggest is off the coast of Oregon and Washington, and two are off the coast of Africa. So those are the ones that scientists really, really worry about. Because it's not like you can say, OK, we'll just stop this practice. You know, we'll stop putting so much extra chemical on our crops and everything will be well. The, the critical difference there is that these things could spread and it's not clear how they could spread. So that's the one that gets scientists really worried about. So you've got increasing acidity, a lack of oxygen um, in, the, in the water column, and then you've got temperature. So of all of that extra heat that's being held against the body of the planet by the extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, about 80% has been absorbed into the ocean. And again, scientists used to say, great, there's the ocean saving us from ourselves, saving us from much worse climate change. But in fact, now they realize that the temperature of the global ocean surface waters has risen. And the latest figure I saw, which was just from a study last week, um, showed that it's up on average 0.33 degrees Celsius since the um, 1870s, when the HMS Challenger did the first global marine study in the uh, in um, around the world, and took temperatures then. So that's that's a very very significant change in average surface temperature 
of the waters. And what that means is that creatures move away from the heat and toward the cool in different parts of the, of the global ocean. And we see that very distinctly in the, in the Arctic, where the Arctic ice is, is melting, obviously. But the, but the example that really struck me when I did my research for this was that I, I ended up going to Plymouth to do a bunch of research on plankton, because they have the people joke that Plymouth, and I think Halifax is the second, uh, you know, the, the next one in this list. Plymouth, they, in Plymouth, they say there are more marine biologists per square foot than anywhere else in the world. And I think Halifax is the close second to that. Um, but they have this fantastic new aquarium that was just set up in 1998 in Plymouth. Uh, it's gl you know glass and and you know and steel, and it's beautiful, and it overlooks the Plymouth Sound. And the centerpiece of this thing is the Mediterranean tank right in the middle of it, and it goes up a whole bunch of stories. And you stand underneath this beautiful you know plexiglass thing, and you look up, and there are all these creatures that are from the Mediterranean. Except that now, in 2012, they can't call it the Mediterranean tank anymore because so many of those creatures now live and breed in the Plymouth Sound just outside. They've moved up from the Mediterranean in just that small amount of time. And those patterns of shifting, you know, shifting geography are, are, are you know, throughout the ocean. It's, it's an astonishing phenomenon and very, very quick. It's not clear exactly what it means. And of course, as the temperature rises, the ocean absorbs less, um, less oxygen. That's the other thing. So if you're a scientist looking at this, what you say is that those three things, the greater acidity in the ocean, the greater warmth, and the decreasing dissolved oxygen, are reproducing the oceans of the past that were characteristic of mass extinctions. That's what a scientist would say. I would say it sounds like we're setting the table for a mass extinction. So if you look back to, um, you know, we, we, we know that there have only been five mass extinctions in the whole history of life on the planet. The last one was 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs died out. Um, and each one of those five mass extinctions has been linked to chemical changes in the ocean, as it turns out. And I've just been doing some research on the Permian extinction, which happened 252 million years ago. And that was what they call the Great Dying. That was the one that was you know, the biggest mass extinction of all, when 95% of creatures on land and in the ocean died. And if you look back to that um, extinction spasm, there were three characteristics in the global ocean. Guess what they were? The ocean became acid, it became warm, and it lost its dissolved oxygen. And the reason that, that those things happened was because the Siberian traps were being formed. This is the newest research coming out of the, the, uh, the paleontological record. That because they were looking at what you know, was it an asteroid? Was it tectonic plate shifting? Was it continent? You know, what was what was the trigger for all of that change in the in the chemistry of the global ocean to cause the great dying? And what they've discovered, what they've settled on finally, is that it was actually the creation of the Siberian traps, which are which is a which is a you know a, a a formation in Siberia that, that is volcanic. And it was this massive volcanic eruption that happened 252 million years ago. The biggest volcanic eruption in 500 million years, actually, that, that, that created this, 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 this chemically altered ocean. And the chemical alteration, of course, came because there was this huge load of carbon in the atmosphere from the volcano. There was a paper out um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in Science. I'm sure some of you have read it because it got a, a huge amount of press, but it was um, this paper calculated that today, as we inject carbon into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, we're putting carbon into the atmosphere 10 times more quickly than the volcanoes that created the Siberian traps and caused the mass extinction of 252 million years ago. So what we're doing today is 10 times worse than the worst volcano in the last 500 million years. That was a very sobering paper for me to read. So. Is it an ethical issue? So let's think about that one for a minute. I looked up the word ethics. You know, I'm a journalist. I always look up words, right? <laughs> so what is ethic? What are ethics? Ethics is a system of principles of right conduct. It's about moral duty and obligation. It helps us determine right from wrong. And I think embedded within it are questions of responsibility and forestalling. So in this case, our collective actions over, you know, mainly concentrated in the last 50 years have unwittingly caused great damage to the planet's ability to support life as we know it. And the more we continue in those same actions, putting all of this 
ancient carbon into the atmosphere and the ocean, the more we're going to damage it, putting millions and probably billions of human lives at, work, at risk and, of course, those of many other creatures as well. And over the past 20 years, we've become more and more aware of this. The science has gelled on this. We know what we're doing. And in those 20 years, we've also developed a whole bunch of ways um, to run our world on sources of energy that don't require us to put carbon into the atmosphere. We have the means and the knowledge and the technology to forestall the worst of this. Um, it's preventable, what we're doing to the, to the life forms on Earth. And yet as a species, we're continuing to pour more and more ancient carbon into the atmosphere in greater and greater amounts, not smaller, even as our in information about this, our understanding of it grows. It seems to me that this is a cultural rather than a political or a technical problem. And, and you know, for me, there's a whole other basket of ethical issues that are bound up in this that I hope you'll indulge me if I explore. Um, I think about, you know, because I'm a, a Latin scholar and I'm actually a biblical scholar as well, I, um, liter literature, the Bible is literature is what I study. I think about the biblical story of Job. Job is the, you know, the, he was the guy who sort of noodled along, doing everything right. He was the good guy and uh, uh, the righteous suffer, actually. And, and he, he did everything right until God and Satan decided that they'd have a bit of a wager at his expense and see how far they could press him into, uh, into relinquishing his, uh, his belief in God. And so they, they have a wager about his faithfulness, essentially. And so they punish him. And he loses almost everything. He, his ten children die. Um, he loses the respect of his community. He loses all, all his wealth, his cattle, you know, everything. He loses his health. He ends up with boils covering his body. One of the translations um, of the Bible um, into English uh, calls them the wounds that never sleep. These boils all over his body. And he's punished not for his own actions, but because someone somewhere else decided to do something. Um, of course, Job is based on, it's not just a biblical figure, he's based on earlier stories from Egypt and Sumeria and Assyria and other parts of the Near East. So, so here's the thing about all that extra carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. Some parts of the world have profited from burning it more than others. If you look at the accumulated extra carbon in today's atmosphere and who put it there, the rich countries are by far and away the more, more, most responsible. In fact, that's how they've gotten rich, right? was by using these forms of energy. So if you, uh, you look at the US alone, which has 307 million people, it's responsible for more than a quarter, it's I think the figure is 27.9%, last figure calculated, of all of the extra ancient carbon in the atmosphere. China, which is always fingered as the big bad boy now because it's the biggest national emitter, has 1.3 billion people and it's responsible for less than a tenth of that historical accumulation of extra ancient carbon. And of course, as luck would have it, when you look at which parts of the world are most affected now by the effects of this planetary destabilization um, that the rich countries have benefited from, it happens that the ones that didn't contribute to the problem in the first place are the ones that are hardest hit. Right? It, it's not to say that the rich ones won't suffer over time because they will. It's just that they're not suffering first. Um, it's the poor first. This is poor Job. So here's one example of how this all works, just to tie it all together. We've all been hearing about this terrible, the terrible drought and famine in, um, in the Horn of Africa. So that's Kenya and Ethiopia and Somalia. Tens of thousands of people are dead. A million are in refugee camps, as you and I sit here in this wonderful theater. Uh, Ten million are desperate for help. So far, humanitarian aid has been committed to the tune of something like $2.4 billion. So why is East Africa having a drought? There's not enough rain. Why are the rains forgetting to come? Well, that has to do with changes in the sea surface temperature patterns um, of the Atlantic Ocean and the steady warming in the Indian Ocean, according to some research papers that I've been looking at. So why is the Indian Ocean warming up? It's all that carbon in the atmosphere. It means that the atmosphere is more greedy for moisture and it keeps it there rather than raining it down on African crops. And not only that, but atmospheric circulation patterns are also shifting as a result, meaning that when it rains, it doesn't rain in the same place. So this great famine 
and disaster, humanitarian disaster in the Horn of Africa is not a natural disaster. It was human caused and it was preventable. So this phenomenon of the thirsty atmosphere and therefore the parched land is expected to spread in the next few decades. Um, one respected climate model I looked at recently said that by the middle of the century we'll have severe drought over most of Af Africa, southern Europe, the Middle East, most of the Americas except for Alaska, um, and a few other places but including all of the US to our south, all of Australia and Southeast Asia. And I'm thinking about the population spread of humans and I'm thinking that covers most of us. <laughs> there aren't too many people left out of that. Uh, in, in the biblical story, you know, um, Job triumphs in the end. He gets a sort of a poetic, uh, literary tongue lashing from God, but he ends up redeemed. This, you know, this, um, this figure of the righteous sufferer is redeemed. He ends up having another ten children, poor wife, uh, doubling his wealth, regaining respect, living to the ripe old age of 140, it says in the, in the texts. Uh, no mention of further boils. So he's, he's sort of all back to normal. And the question of whether the world's righteous climate suffers, if you want to you know, put that framework on it, can expect the same fate as an open question. It depends on us and people like us and people we elect to uh, negotiate international treaties that will get some of that atmosphere out of the ocean, out of the atmosphere, cut some of that carbon out of the atmosphere and stop putting it into the ocean. I figure, for example, and this is an aside, um, that if Prime Minister Stephen Harper really felt that he was going to lose seats um, over an issue of, you know, carbon, that I think he'd change his stance. I think if we made him understand what we really think about this, or if people who really feel strongly about this made their point, I think he might change his stance. Certainly it's not happening in Canada now, and, and it is happening in some other parts of the world. So the thing I have to keep reminding myself is that we have this little small window in which we can act. And and of course that brings us to hope. So given all of whoa. <laughs> so given all of this, how do you hope? Do you hope? Is it is it right to hope? Do you just give up? Do you dance the dance of despair? The the glorious dance of death that they danced during the plague years in the fourteen hundreds and, and just give it all up. Um, and I have to say no. I, I've been through my own despair on this. It's been very deep. Um, alas, I went into quite a severe depression writing seasick, went to bed for about a month, my poor husband. <laughs> um, and I really didn't think that I could get out of bed and write the book and do the last journey, the 13th of the, of the journeys that I had said I would do for this, for this book. And, you know, I, I finally made myself get up out of bed and go on the very last journey because it was a journey to the bottom of the ocean that I had arranged to go into in a submersible. So. Um, and it was, it was to see part of the world nobody had ever seen before, at 3,000 feet in a submersible with two, with a pilot, a scientist, and an engineer, just four of us on this little tiny vessel. And there are only a handful of vessels in the world that even go that deep. And it's, it, was, it, was, it was an astonishing gift to even be given the chance to this thing, to go on this thing. So I decided that I would just go. And I went into this, onto this vessel, and we went to 3,000 feet. And I was absolutely terrified the entire time. And this whole despair over the planet vanished in the face of my personal worry about my own future, right? It was, and, and, and it was, there was something about going that deep, going that, it, to that, that place on the planet that had pushed me beyond every limit I had, every single limit, that somehow allowed me to realize that through all of this, all of this research for this book, all of the journeying, to try to f make sense of what I was finding out about the ocean and our, our hand at changing its chemistry. All of that had led me to try to convince myself that there should be reason to hope. Is that somehow I could sort of, you know, plot a course to hope through all of this stuff and be rational about it. And there I was at the bottom of the ocean, 3,000 feet, it's freezing cold there. I'm surrounded by all of these creatures that have never been seen before, part of the planet that has never been seen before. And the wonder and the joy of just being human in that, in that place just overwhelmed me. And I, I, I realized that we don't have to convince ourselves to hope. We don't have to use logic to get us there. We simply have to be human and choose to hope. And without that hope, 
there really is none. So there's, this, there's always this tricky question, is transformation possible in the face of all of this situation that we're talking about? And it's a trick question because is transformation possible? It's only possible if you believe it to be possible. So I think what's needed here is a cultural shift, a, a choosing to be fully human at a time when the planet needs it from us most. We can plan. We can fix this. We still have time. It's not game over. And there's an enormous dignity, I think, in honoring the messiness of that and the messiness of the journey that's gotten us there and just simply rising to the surface again out of the depression, out of the deeps, and moving on. And with that... I thank you. Uh, can you give an outline how the things will change, considering what the governments, especially North American governments in US and Canada are doing on the climate change? Do you have any sort of thoughts or the roadmap that you know the things will change for the better in the future? For the better? Yeah. Or for the worse? I'm hoping for a better, you know. It you know, be, it's, yeah. it's funny you ask that because, you know, they're, they're really, I think there really are signs of hope. They're hard to see, but I think there are some, and, and they're, not in, they're not in our federal government in Canada right now. Um, you know, in the States, in the States there's, there's some fascinating stuff going on that is not, um, that is not discernible above that, that very, very dissonant, that, that polarized, public discourse is happening in the US in this election year. So in the in the US, you know, people don't talk about climate change. I'm told that they can't even use the words climate change in most US discourses. They can use climate variability, which is <laughs> which is okay politically correct, but they can't use climate change or global warming in the discourse. And so that's what's happening, at, you know, sort of at the Fox News level in the US. But what seems to be happening at the deeper political levels in the US is that, th that this stuff is being taken incredibly seriously. I was at a conference in Washington um, in January, which is known as the Environmental Davos, uh, you know, because it's, it's such a high level, high powered um, meeting of people. And what astounded me was the words coming out of the mouths of some of the presenters at this conference who were top military and ex-military people in the US. And if I had heard an environmentalist say those words, I would have been shocked to my core at the honesty of it. But these were military people, these were Pentagon people who were saying they absolutely have no question about what's going on, what the science says. They know they have to adapt in the US and they know that the mitigation is important as well. And this, this, you know, the stuff that seems so controversial in the US in the public discourse is not at all controversial to the Pentagon, which let's face it, has a lot of money. So that was one of the one of the little sort of threads of hope that that I've seen in Europe. This stuff is taken incredibly seriously. I mean, the, I was at the Durban uh, talks, the climate talks, the Kyoto talks in uh, in Durban in December, and you know, Europe was right there. They were they were ready to make almost anything work. You know, they worked. They, they, it was it was actually it was actually India that torpedoed those talks in the event. It wasn't China. It wasn't the U.S. It was India. Um, and and for, for reasons that are that are really hard to understand, given what's going to happen to, to India <laughs> as climate change intensifies. So you, you know, I think that there is quite a bit of progress uh, at some levels, at different at different you know stratums throughout the world. I don't think it's happening right now at the international level in the way that it needs to. I mean, what happened in Durban was that nothing happened in Durban. We don't have anything concrete to pull down uh, carbon levels in the atmosphere, which is what we ultimately need. The discourse is still about, you know, you know, making emissions grow more slowly, but that's not enough. We actually have to pull carbon out of the atmosphere if we're going to have a, a life support system that works for life as we know it now. Yeah. Thank you very much for your excellent talk and also for your excellent book. I encourage everyone to get a copy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two quick questions. I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the federal government's planned increase to natural resource development and militarization in the Arctic, particularly offshore oil and gas mm -hmm. in the ocean. And two, I'm wondering, um, you didn't specify this in your book, but I'm just wondering about the Navy's 
uh, impact on the ocean because right. the Halifax shipyard won a $25 billion contract to build uh, warships. And so we're going to see increase to, you know, warships in our, in our ocean. So what should, we con what should we be concerned about? I mean, that $25 billion could have been instead invested in natural in a national green collar job strategy, you know, taking action on climate change and poverty, affordable housing, etc. Mm -hmm. But instead, it's going to build warships. So what should we be concerned about in terms of the impacts of the Navy on our oceans and marine environment? Thank you. Right. It, that's a complex question, the Navy question, um, because, you know, some of the some of the Navy people I know have been some of the biggest supporters of, you know, understanding um, the ocean and in promoting research on it. So I, I can't, I can't tell you that I think that, you know, that building ships for the Navy is, is necessarily a bad thing. I just, I can't, I haven't got the full, you know, the full analysis of that. I do know that much of the research over time that has been conducted on the ocean and on marine life in general has, has stemmed from the military's need of that, of that information. So, so there's, I think it's a bit of a double-edged sword. On the, um, exploration of the Arctic and the, um, the increasing investments in, uh, in carbon-based fuels, it's, it's, um, Sheer folly. There's no excuse for it. Anybody else? I have a live stream question. Okay. As I mentioned, we do have a number of people participating uh, via live stream, and, and one of the questions that's come in is, what advice would you give to young and future researchers who are trying to make positive changes for our oceans? That is, that is such a great question. I mean, this is one of the areas where I think we need, we almost need the most, the best brains, you know, is, is in some of these areas. We just, um, research on the oceans is still relatively new. It's only really since the, the end of the Second World War that we have very much information at all on how the ocean works and, and the, the whole concept of how the ocean works together with the atmosphere and, and all of these interconnections that are just being explored, I think is one of the greatest um, areas of research that, sh that, that could really prove, um, prove rich for humanity. If, you know, if, if people are going to are going to research that, that's where I would. If I were to go into marine, bi marine biology today, that's where I would, I would study. So it's the ecology of the marine system and how it works with the atmosphere. I think is is going to be a really important thing to know about. Anybody else? I, I just want to mention that uh, we had uh, Gwen Dyer here um, a few years ago uh, uh, when uh, climate wars uh, uh, was out, and uh, he made the same point you made about uh, the military. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that uh, speaking with military people in uh, Great Britain, uh, he discovered that uh, the reason that the, uh, uh, the British um, revived their nuclear weapons program uh, was to keep uh, Great Britain safe when the ocean started to rise. <laughs> um, <laughs> that there seemed to be no other justification, and I think the term Fortress Britain was, uh, was used. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, something that um, uh, worries me and, and makes hope difficult for me, and that is uh, what we would have to give up mm -hmm. in order to uh, 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 forestall catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean giving up our uh, cars or washing machines. I'm worried about things like the prosperity that markets bring us. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, political democracy, mm -hmm. uh, political equality. Uh, these are systems that are um, wonderful for any number of reasons, but they're really quite inefficient. And they um, often respond to, uh, to the wrong sorts of cues. Uh, do you think that um, things like market economies, uh, political equality, uh, democracy, um, will have to uh, take a back seat to the uh, to, to the struggle to uh, 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 stop uh, uh, carbon and uh, um, yeah. uh, mitigate uh, climate change. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic, fantastic question. It's one that I've done a little bit of reading on, and I'm not the expert on this at all. I mean, I'm uh, what I study is the science of this stuff. But the stuff I have read suggests to me that we don't have to give up all that stuff. That we could just. I mean, and the reason I think that is that I, I was looking recently at 
For example, the, I, I was researching whether the Kyoto Protocol had been successful as a protocol. What, what did it set out to do and what did it actually accomplish? And we think of it in Canada as a terrible failure and, you know, the U.S. didn't even ratify it. You know, we ratified it now. We're, we've said we're going to withdraw from it um, in the next you know, phase of Kyoto, it's much smaller, it covers only 17% of countries that are emitters, so, or 17% of, em of emissions. But in fact, if you look at the Kyoto Protocol and what it set out to accomplish when it was signed, it much more than met that, strangely enough. I know it sounds, you know, we think of it as such a, as having just been, been a bust, but all over the world it was taken very, very seriously by developed countries. So if you look at the list, at the roster of countries that have met and exceeded what they said they would, reduce their emissions by in the, in the period, and this is, this is to about 2010, which I think is the latest reporting period, it's, we, it's, it's a huge success as, as a mechanism, an international mechanism, and most of those countries are democratic countries, they're, they're I mean, almost uniquely democratic countries because of the developed world. So it's not that this stuff can't be done, I mean, the, the canonical example on this is, is Germany, which, you know, whose economy grew and thrived even as it cut, um, as it cut its emissions, um, but all through Europe and through many other countries, you see the same pattern of behavior. And these are an intelligent shifts in an economy that didn't erode democratic rights or market rights or, you know, any of the things that, that you were talking about. I don't think it's necessary. I just think we haven't figured out, I mean, I've seen a formula that could be put into place, could, could do this quite seamlessly without a huge amount of disjunction disjuncture to the economy of the world. I've, I mean, I've seen lots of plans that seem to be to me to be reasonable, but I'm not an economist. But it seems as though there are lots of really smart brains thinking about this, and I, it's, it seems like there could be tweaks that would make this happen rather, um, rather seamlessly, is what I've, what I've observed. Yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, like ethics and things like this, and, and based on um, you're, you're talking about the scientific uh, research that you worked with. But do you think it's exactly uh, like maybe eth ethical? I don't, I don't know how to put this, but do you think it'd be exactly ethical to uh, use your journalistic abilities, which you clearly have, to sort of focus on a perspective that may not be um, sort of shared by the scientific community at large? It's still, sort of a highly debated issue. A lot of these things that were sort of listed as scientific facts may or may not be uh, facts. Do you think that's um, maybe an ethical issue kind of thing? or? It's a great question. So are you, are you talking about the facts of climate change? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, the fact of climate change, uh, like ocean, uh, ocean acidification, mm -hmm. um, that was one of the, I guess, the three, ca uh, three mm -hmm. causes you had list for um, ocean I don't, warming. I don't, think, I don't think there's actually any debate about those, not in the, not in the true scientific community. Oh, the true scientific, okay. Um, so there's a, like a true scientific community? Well, there's a scientific community of people who are trained to study this and who have come to conclusions about it, who are almost unanimous about the, these things. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. We have another live stream question. Um, quotes, we keep blaming the federal government, but we're all consumers of carbon. Regulation is one strategy, but what about personal ethics? We don't seem to have the motivation to change our behavior. Any advice? <laughs> you guys are obviously softballing the questions here. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, we do talk about personal responsibility, and I, of course, believe that we have personal responsibility for this. But I think it's fair, I, mean, I think this is because I just came back from Durban and saw, you know, what, what happened there, and I think that, um, I think it's fair that when we have elected representatives who are uniquely um, given the responsibility to, to, to bargain with other countries on our behalf at an international level, I think it's fair to expect them to, and I'm not talking just here about Stephen Harper, um, I'm talking about all of those, those leaders who gathered in Durban to make a treaty that would, that would help preserve our life, our life support systems. Um, and they didn't. And, and it seems to me that it's, it, you can't, I don't know that you can shift the blame away from them on some level. Like, I think they bear a certain responsibility for coming to a deal when they uniquely have the power to do that. I mean, you and I can't go and sit in that room over the 36 hours of the final debates in Durban and, and make a decision on behalf of our country. Only Peter Kent could do that as our representative and as representative of Stephen Harper. So I think that there's a, there is an ethical issue in who gets to do that who gets to do those negotiations. And I think there's a bit of a, 
I think there's a bit of a you know, a trend to say, oh, it's, it's individual responsibility and it's, it's all about what we do. And I think that there is a certain amount of that in the sense that the cultural under, underpinning of what we expect our leaders to do is, is, is in our hands to some degree. But I, I think that, you know, it's going to take a lot more than you and me just changing our light bulbs and making other changes that we personally can make to our lifestyles. It's going to have to be a much bigger scale shift in the economy and in the engine of the economy before this turns around. So I, I think that in a way it's a bit of a dodge to say that it's all about personal responsibility, because which is not what our questioner is saying, but I think it has to do more with us believing that it needs to happen and shifting through um, this cultural change, pushing through this cultural change that has to happen. And you can see how that's been effective, for example, in, in parts of Europe, where really there does seem to have been a cultural shift against um, putting so much carbon into the atmosphere. So what we can actually, you know, the, the, the motivation, oh, I don't know. I think people are actually much further along this road than, than it might seem from um, some of the public discourse. I think that there's actually, most people are, understand the stuff, I think they feel incredibly guilty. And I think the guilt is paralytic. I think that's one of the phenomena that's happening. There's, there's sorrow and paralysis and guilt. And it would be, I think, really important to shift some of that, some of that public discourse, some of that public feeling into a sense of, yes, we can um, make this happen. We, it is possible to write a new ending to this narrative. It doesn't have to be that this is all going to, we're all going to die and it's all going to end in this catastrophic way. We can actually change this. And that piece has been missing from a lot of the, the public narrative that's been, that's been talked about so far, in my understanding of it. Um, I think my comment, uh, you've just captured it in your last few sentences here, because I was wondering if, in fact, we are experiencing climate change fatigue. Yeah. If the average person on the street is overwhelmed by what we're hearing and powerless, and, and you just made some, some comments about that. So knowing you know, how people react to, to crises, knowing about the issues we have in our democracy and... And, and an aging democracy, which yes. is becoming more conservative, yep. not more adventuresome in many cases. Uh, how, do we, how does an individual react to that in 2012? I think it takes great nerve and wit and humor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and beyond that, I just, I, I think it's just a, I really think it's on some level just a, um, it's that we just don't have the luxury not to. You know, we just don't have the time to despair. Yeah, so then we have to keep going, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for, okay, no. Okay, yeah, so thank you for uh, the great talk. It was really quite um, eye-opening, and it's not just based on, like you've hit some topics that are not just based on um, the biological, the mar marine-based, um, ethics but just ethics in general and I just had a quick question about like have you been able to work with any kind of cultural perspectives on ethics through your research with other researchers who have different ideas on what their cultural I guess values and morals are in terms of this whole issue and being able to be open to other ideas and not just you know like one one area of change but like have you been able to work with other um, varying backgrounds um, culturally in your research? Yeah, that's a great question again. I, I did um, some of the research for this book and for the first book in um, indigenous communities. So I spent uh, some time in the Amazon with uh, a tribe there for, for the research for the first book. And in this book, I spent a little bit of time in Africa. And I spent some time in the northern uh, Canadian uh, communities as well. So I, I, I understand that there's a whole bunch of different <laughs> cultural uh, richness that can come to this to, to this you know this whole issue which I think is fantastic and, and you know one of the other things that has happened as a result of this book that I wrote for me has been that I've been contacted by a whole bunch of artists all over the world which is a whole other perspective that I hadn't really taken into account because they're trying to make some of these ideas accessible to people who can't be reached by a book like mine, can't be reached by scientists, can't be reached by... So they're writing poems and they're, and they're doing artwork, visual artwork, they're make, making plays, they're, 
the, the the output music, the music that's come that, that has just come to my door, people you know from people who have composed things, has been astonishing. And so it's it's you know I think of it as a scientific and literary endeavor, but there are all these other ways of seeing it, I think, that are quite powerful as well. And I think are spreading. I really think these are spreading in ways that are hard to calculate. And and I, I, I think there truly is a movement, and it's massive, and it's taking much more... Um, much more space in the public domain than we're probably conscious of. And I think it's driven partly by these very... Uh, these other views of understanding the world, like from other cultures and from other disciplines like art and music. And I just had another quick question. Uh, do you think that um, just with your own kind of growing up and who you've become, like, do you think that there's been more of a ethical and moral decay in our society in terms of kind of wondering where we're going now as a, as a future, as a, as a human yeah, race? I'm do you think that there's been... Mm -hmm. a shift towards on kind of traditional ideals and that we should go back to more tr tried and true kind of classical ideals to help us with the situation that we're in? I, I get what you're saying and I, I can't say that I do think that. I don't think that there has been moral decay. I don't think, I, I mean what I see in my world around me is this incredible explosion of communication yeah. across cultures and and a breaking down of some of the barriers that were that were I think problems. I mean I see enormous, enormous potential in our world today and it may not, it, it's messy. Mm. Yeah, but think of all the incredible advances that have happened as a result of our technological um, abilities and our and our you know our willingness to think about issues in different ways. I thought I, I I would say it's the reverse of moral decay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. The uh, the last question to come from our live stream audience is as follows, and this will this will interest you given your opening remarks about maybe you should move to Nova Scotia. We have an amazing resource here in Nova Scotia with ocean access. Could we use Nova Scotia as a model uh, for regulation? And if so, what would it or could it be? Oh, oh you, you guys, these questions, you're, you're astonishing. Um, it is, it is, it would probably, it should be on the ocean, you know, like this, this, um, but the regulation that is needed, of course, is to do with carbon, which is, which is global. So I, I don't know. What could it look like? Could we use it as a model of regulation? And if so, what could it be? You know, what you've got here is people who love the ocean. And that's, that's got to be the first step in any, you know, global um, campaign or global effort to get people to understand why it matters. So, I mean, I, I think that that would be the way, the way you'd start. I mean, where you go from there, I just don't have a clue. This is not me. <laughs> Great question, though. You want to? You can be the last. I just, I read your book years ago, and so it's not fresh in my mind, but there were some points that you made that have stayed with me because I think that reading Seasick was one of those pivotal moments for me because you often, I've worked for the Department of Environment in the past and I've always been in, involved with environmental issues, but you always hear climate change, climate change, but you never really hear much about the ocean. So I think your book really was an eye opener from that perspective and I've been telling everyone I know to read it. And I think one other thing that struck me about the book and even about your talk tonight is that you reference a lot of female scientists, which I think is refreshing because we don't often see as many females as male. And I think um, one thing that I really liked about the book was the fact that it was annotated so well and it does show obviously your journalistic background because it was so well referenced. And if I wanted, if I had any questions about any fact in the book, I could look at the bibliography and pinpoint it. And so there's no doubt in my mind about the ethics or anything involved in that. Thank you. But um, <laughs> here's my little diatribe. But uh, one thing I was wondering about, and because I read it a while ago, I can't quite remember, but one issue that we see kind of I think that's of growing concern here in Nova Scotia mm -hmm. is uh, the growth in the aquaculture industry yeah. because you you'd mentioned agriculture and we know that the contribution of animal agriculture to carbon and emissions but uh, one thing that's not necessarily mentioned a lot is the role that aquaculture can play in, in uh, this, the health of the oceans. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's an issue. It's a huge issue here and in NBC as well and in other parts of the world. I mean, I have actually seen it done well. I saw it re done really well in Australia where they're, you know, the, 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 they, they mean for it to last, which doesn't seem to be the principle in a lot of other parts of the world. And I'm not familiar with precisely what's going on in Nova Scotia, except that the few studies I've read have, have indicated that there are some very significant problems with, um, with localized pollution from it. Um, and you know what we need is is a is a really i think is a is this is maybe where the regulation could come in we could have really 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 smart um management of that thing of that of that of, of aquaculture so that we got the protein so that we got you know a good out of it but and didn't foul the nest you know and and it would just take some oversight and some some really strict science and some management of it that would that would you know would make that happen and we've seen that in other parts of the world and it's worked incredibly well. It doesn't work well in Canada and it doesn't work well in a bunch of other, like China, you know, is, is, is a disaster on this, but it could work well and I think it's, it's worth bearing that in mind and maybe that's precisely where, um, you know, people in Nova Scotia could really start would be by, you know, using the science and the oversight to really make it into something that could be a, could be a significant part of the economy. Well, I think that's one of the challenges here is because the provincial government has a certain mandate and then when you get to the ocean, it goes to DFO. To the federal and, government, yeah. And you know where <laughs> their headspace is right now. So I think that is one of the challenges that we need to overcome and where we personally can make our, our will known at, right. at the federal level. I think that's the only way is to voice our concerns. Well, it, it seems to be a... Uh, you know, a principle of democracy that we can do that, uh, you know, <laughs> and that we should, if we feel strongly about something, we, you know, it, it should be possible to make it happen, you know, it seems to me. One of the challenges I see <laughs> with the current government federally is uh, the fact that he's sort of build environmentalists as uh, well, enemies of the state. Terrorists. Enem enemy, yeah, enemies of the state. <laughs> so, anyway. Yeah, well, you know, um, there's a cure for bad government. Yes. It's called an election. <laughs> In three and a half years. So. Yeah, if it takes that long. We'll have to be hopeful. <laughs> Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Let me, in closing, thank uh, those of you present in the room for, your, for attending and for your engagement. And let me also thank our live stream audience for their active participation in tonight's program, too. I think uh, many of our questioners have, uh, have already expressed their, their deep appreciation to Alana, and I want to, to echo that. Um, your presentation didn't lack at all for not being a PowerPoint because you spoke from, from both the heart and from the science. And that combination is, is extremely powerful. And you shared with us stories that I, I think will resonate with everybody in the room and, and clearly have people thinking about personal responsibility and collective responsibility and how we might take a leadership role in addressing some of the, the very significant problems that, that you've identified. But that message of hope at the end uh, and your, your, your call to action, so to speak, that, that it's, there's still time to, to address some of these issues do, I think, give us a, a potential agenda for moving forward. So please join me again in thanking Alana most sincerely for her presentation.